If you've been wanting to stack dimes with your MIG welder and get that rippled look, I'm gonna break down the recipe for you in this video and show you how to get it every single time. Now, the way I do it's a little different from the common technique, but I think it works a little bit better for me. We're gonna test these welds out, see how well they can hold up to some abuse, and also compare the speed running this technique to running a regular stringer bead. This is a video I've put off making for a long time because other than the aesthetics, this technique has some drawbacks. It opens up opportunity for uh, discontinuities and a weaker joint. And it also is just a little more slow and challenging to run. So we'll break all that down. Now let's talk about the technique itself. Uh, it starts off with your settings. So I'm using the HTP today in synergic mode. So my wire speed and voltage are gonna to move together. This is common in a lot of machines now, but if you have a chart, you can do the same thing I'm gonna do. So I'm welding on one eighth inch thick or a three millimeter thick plate here today. And so I need to run a lower setting than I normally would to be able to allow time for each of those ripples to cool. So I'd normally be around 300 inches per minute. I'm gonna run right around 200 inches per minute and it shows my amperage will be around 80 amps. Now the voltage is going to need to be a little bit higher than it normally would for that wire feed speed. So I go up about a volt. So I'm sitting around 200 inches per minute and 17 volts here to stack dimes on this 1 8 inch thick plate. Now this is more challenging on thinner material like this 1 8 inch than it is on quarter inch. On quarter inch, it's a lot easier because you have a bigger heat sink and you can really get them to pop, but you can still do it just fine on 1 8 inch like I'm gonna show you right here. So if you look at that heat signature, you can see that I'm making a bit of a manipulation. Let me show you what that looks like and then explain uh, exactly what I'm doing. So this is a T-joint and we're putting a fillet weld in it. And so let me show you right here. Let's say that's your joint and I'll draw this really big. So what you're looking for are these overlapped ovals. You know, I bought this blackboard thinking this is gonna be just the coolest thing ever, but it's so reflective. I, I don't know, I think that's almost a distraction. Here we go. So you're looking to have these overlapped ovals like that. Now the common technique is to come and do a loop like that and a loop like that, but you can miss a spot right there. So I, I don't really like to do that. I like to go forward and then make kind of a T shape and then forward into kind of a T shape, forward, kind of a T shape like that. As with any MIG welding process, all of the fundamental elements of technique, that's what I call them in my online courses, uh, still apply. So make sure you're using good technique. And notice I'm using a slight drag angle. You can use a push or a drag angle with short circuit MIG welding. But with this technique, a drag angle does seem to be a little bit beneficial. Now to test this out, I'm gonna use a fillet weld break test, which means I'm bending the root or the bottom of the weld open without any weld on the backside. I'm checking the size of the weld here just to know what we're dealing with because an oversized weld is gonna be stronger. And this one was about 3 16 of an inch, which is slightly oversized for a 1 8 inch thick plate, but it's not totally unreasonable, especially when you're running this technique, it's kind of hard to get it to be smaller. So I'm gonna go ahead and bend this over. Now with a fillet weld break test, on thicker plate, the fillet weld will snap right through the middle generally, but on thinner material, it'll bend over. And if you bend it all the way over, that's typically considered a pass. And I feel pretty good about it, how uh, this one's going right here. I won't push it all the way to the bottom because you can clearly see that it's bending in the plate and uh, not opening the root up at all. Let's take a closer look at the uh, results here on this thinner material on this 1 8 inch thick uh, plate. 
Now, it didn't open that bottom up at all, so I feel pretty good about that. I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely good enough for a lot of situations. What about on thicker material? Let's try it here on some quarter inch or six millimeter thick plate. I need to make a better setup for these fillet weld brake tests because the stuff I've got laying around just doesn't cut it when you get into a little bit thicker material. This is quarter inch thick. Now, the fillet weld size here is 3 16 very similar to that 1 8 inch thick material. And it just wasn't happening with the wrenches. I was sliding my fixture table around, so I decided to go for uh, my grandpa's hammer here. And I'm working on this thing and hardly making any headway. And so I, I realized, you know, this vice just isn't uh, isn't gonna hold up to this. So I mean, I mean, it's holding up just fine, but it just doesn't have the grip for the abuse I'm giving this thing. I'm I'm you know really giving it the beans there. So I'm gonna have to cut this in half and do it in halves. You can see it's starting to give way a little bit, and uh, hopefully once I get it in two pieces, it'll go just a little bit better. All right, well, since I cut it anyway, I figured I might as well throw a light etch on there. And you can see some penetration into either plate. That looks fine. It barely got down to the corner, at least at this section. But uh, breaking it in half will show a little bit better representation of what we have along the length. So let's see if I can get these things in half. Let's go ahead and take a look at these results here. So uh, I'm seeing that it broke right through the throat of the weld. That's good news in and of itself. You know, it, it bonded to the plates really well. But the thing to look at on a fillet weld brake test is that edge down at the corner. And you wanna see that straight line consumed and you can see it's still a straight line. So in a lot of books, that'd be a fail, but I'll say it's pretty, uh, pretty stout weld right there still. And you could oversize it a little bit more to compensate for some of that. Here on the other side, you can see some of those scallops. So it was starting to get down into the root and perhaps with a little bit more work on technique and settings, you could dial it in. But I still am confident that you would have a better weld with a straight stringer bead than you're gonna get with one of these. But if you need the aesthetics, it's good enough for a lot of things. So let's just for contrast look at a straight stringer bead. You can see how big the weld puddle is. It fills that whole weld zone as I run and I'm able to stay up on that leading edge of the puddle to make sure I penetrate right down into the root. So I have more confidence in a weld like this than I do in a weld like this. But if you choose your situation wisely, in a lot of cases you want that aesthetic, it's gonna be good enough. Now, a major reason to have a wire feed welder is just for efficiency sakes. And when you turn your settings way down, obviously you're gonna have to travel more slowly. Also, you're putting in that weave pattern. And so I just thought it'd be interesting to compare the time running a similar size stringer bead and stack and dimes right here. So if you watch, you can see I'm way ahead on the stringer bead and I'm gonna finish here pretty quickly. And this is something to keep in mind, right? Because you wanna be productive, you wanna be efficient. And if you get a better weld structurally quicker, I think that's a win. But once again, there's nothing wrong with uh, stacking some dimes in an appropriate space where you're happy with the efficiency and structural integrity that you get. Hey, well, thanks a ton for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, let me know by hitting that thumbs up. And with any of these techniques and understanding of the fundamentals and getting those basic fundamental skills down is going to be critical. So I break those down a little bit more in this video here, or if you wanna get serious about your learning and have me walk step-by-step -step through practice exercises to reinforce them in the fastest possible way, my online courses are linked right here.